Communist Party uh, uh, Facebook and uh, also on Twitter, so that uh, if you can't access this meeting itself, you can um, hear the meeting on Facebook. Um, so I hope that's okay. I hope you have no objection to that, but it's a webinar, so basically the speakers have agreed to this. I'd also like to say that the Beijing Review, which is a national English language weekly, have requested to record to tonight's meeting, and they are, of course, very welcome, and we're very pleased to have them with us. Um, I'll be chairing the meeting. Uh, unfortunately, Alex Gordon, who was going to be the chair, is unwell, and he's asked me to stand in for him. Um, my name is Mary Adesidis. I'm Secretary of the London District Committee of the Communist Party of Britain, and I'm, uh, this meeting has been co-hosted -host by the London District Committee and by the International Com Com Commission, and Kevin Nelson, who is one of our speakers, is its secretary. So uh, I'd like to welcome our speakers as well. Um, before I invite our speakers to speak, and we have three speakers, we have Andrew Murray, Jenny Clegg, and Kevin Nelson, and I'll tell you a bit more about them in turn as they speak. I want to just point out that the Communist Party, as soon as they heard, we heard that the, the war was breaking out, uh, published a statement, and it was a very good statement, and I think it's worth reading it. It was rightly concerned that the conflicts and political differences should be, not be resolved by war. We're totally opposed to war. And as soon as the war broke out, um, it stated that it believes this is a conflict between capitalist powers, the Ukraine on one side, Russia on the other, and to remind participants that neither Zelensky nor Putin have the interests of the working class of the peoples of Russia and Ukraine at heart. Also, the Communist Party highlighted the dangers of this war for Europe and for the world. The Communist Party pointed out the dangers of NATO, which has been expanding since um, the fall of the Soviet Union very rapidly uh, to the east and to the borders of Russia, which is one of the reasons for the war. And um, there, have been, there are many different aspects to this war. It's caused, uh, there, are, there are issues around the republics of the Donbas and the Crimea. There is the issue of, Putin puts it as the need for denazification, and I hope our speakers will comment on that. And it's causing huge and massive disruption here in Britain domestically, as sanctions have meant a dramatic rise of energy and food prices, amplifying the cost of living uh, crisis to catastrophic levels. The refugee crisis has amplified, and all this against a background of anti-Russian hysteria. Finally, before I call on our speakers, there are two more points I'd like to make. Um, there is the issue of China, which is why I'm so pleased Jenny Clegg is with us, who abstained in the UN Security Council meeting alongside many other countries. It explicitly joined Russia in opposing any further expansion of NATO. It refused to describe the attack on Ukraine as an invasion, and it sought to blame the US and European Union for the conflict. And I'd be very, I'm looking forward to hear Jenny's comments on this. Um, China denounced the Indo-Pacific strategy of Washington and its new security partnership, the AUKUS Treaty, which includes Britain, the US and Australia. Um, we know that China has been an ally of Putin and voted against the motion uh, opposing the war in the Security Council. So a very, very broad outline of some of the issues we're facing with this war. But I'd like to call our speakers now. Our first speaker is Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray is well known in the Labour movement. He's been uh, with Stop the War for many years. I remember him speaking um, against the war in Iraq many, many years ago, and he's still very active with our Stop the War. He's its deputy president. And thank you, Andrew, for being with us. And I look forward to hearing your contribution. Okay, thank you, Mary. And thank you for the 
uh, invite to speak to you this evening. You mentioned just there the Iraq war, uh, and it's worth recalling this weekend will be the anniversary of the start of the Iraq war, the 19th uh, anniversary. Uh, and I think what's happening around the world today is shows we are living very much in a world that the Iraq war made, uh, in the sense it was a uh, flagrant violation of uh, international law, uh, a regime change war that caused untold uh, hardship and devastation for the people of uh, Iraq. Uh, and it is cited frequently since by many countries around the world as evidence of US uh, hypocrisy and how hollow all the talk is of a so-called rules-based international uh, order. Uh, so uh, in, in talking now today about Ukraine and what's happening there, we can't forget the background uh, of the horrific war uh, in Iraq, the other conflicts in Afghanistan and Libya, uh, likewise, uh, uh, without um, any form of legitimate international sanction uh, that uh, have caused so much devastation this century. And we cannot isolate what's happening now from what's been happening uh, over uh, the last uh, 19, uh, 20 years that Stop the War Coalition has been uh, campaigning. Now, in relation to the present war, uh, the Stop the War Coalition has condemned the Russian uh, invasion. Uh, and uh, called for the Russian uh, ceasefire and for the Russian troops to withdraw. And that is the right thing uh, to do. Uh, the war is causing a vast hardship to people of Ukraine, both the four million who have uh, fled, been displaced as refugees, uh, and those living in cities uh, under, uh, under bombardment. Uh, the threshold for uh, a just war is rightly a very high one. Uh, in international law, it can only be justified if you're under threat of aggression, uh, immediate threat of aggression, or uh, if an act of genocide is taking place. Uh, and I don't think anyone can seriously say that either of those conditions uh, were met uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this case. So Stop the War Coalition does see uh, uh, as part of a solution to this uh, an end to the Russian military action uh, in uh, uh, in Ukraine. There are now negotiations taking place. We must hope that they, uh, are, um, uh, they are fruitful, uh, and we must hope that the Russian government does not uh, extend its military action to a try and attempt wholesale regime change uh, in Ukraine. But that is only part of what we, of what we have to say, uh, because the Stop the War Coalition throughout its, uh, its history has always said our campaigning edge is directed against the British government. We don't just you know, pontificate about international politics in general. We look at the British role, the role of Britain and its allies, and how our policy, the British policy, has contributed to this situation and what changes are needed uh, to uh, assist uh, the cause of uh, peace uh, in the world. And I don't think there can be any doubt that British policy, supporting uh, American policy, basically, has contributed uh, an immense amount to the present crisis, not in a way that justifies what President Putin has done, but in a way that does uh, explain uh, uh, it or uh, aspects of it. Firstly, there is the uh, expansion of NATO, uh, which has been going on for most of the last 30 years in violation of promises that were given to the Soviet leadership at the time uh, in 1990, 1991. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, carried on uh, right up to the borders uh, of Russia, with in the recent years, NATO troops being moved into those countries. We also have to note, and I've alluded to this already, that most of the wars in the last 25 years, the Yugoslav war, the Afghan war, the Libyan war, were fought as NATO wars. So the idea that NATO is just a defensive alliance is not credible. And so the idea that a Russian government would put these two facts together, the extension of NATO to its borders and breach of promises given, and uh, NATO's record around the world over the last generation, uh, they would have every right uh, to be uh, very uh, concerned. 
And of course, they've been raising these concerns for many years now. Putin first did it in, I think, 2007, 15 uh, years ago. As a result, the only outcome was in 2008, NATO offered to extend NATO still further into Ukraine and Georgia. Now, it's true that nothing has been done to give effect to that intention uh, over these uh, um, uh, last 14 years. But nevertheless, the security relationship uh, has got much tighter between the USA and Ukraine. Just last November, a, a new a strategic security agreement was signed between the two countries, outlining all forms, sort of forms of military cooperation. And that was explicitly directed uh, against, uh, uh, against Russia. So from that uh, point of view, uh, the, uh, the, the UK and the US have pursued a policy hostile to Russia for uh, a number uh, of years and have been blind to the fact that security needs to be all encompassing. Uh, one can't look at one country's security in isolation from everyone else, or at least everyone else uh, in that part of uh, uh, that part of the world. Internal developments in Ukraine have also helped uh, push us to this point. Now, what happens in Ukraine is ultimately a matter of the Ukrainians. But in 2014, there was a coup against an elected government uh, in Ukraine that brought to power uh, a, a Western, a, a West Ukrainian nationalist. Uh, mentality. Now, I don't accept that the Ukrainian government can be called neo-Nazi. That is an exaggeration at the very best. But neo-Nazism has percolated into Ukrainian political culture quite strongly. And parts of the state uh, apparatus are also uh, uh, aligned with far-right organisations. So those elements can't be uh, ignored uh, either. And that coup in 2014 against the elected president, he was a very corrupt president, but he was nevertheless an elected president. Uh, the EU, Britain, USA were all deeply involved in promoting and consolidating uh, that uh, coup as well. So really, British fingerprints uh, are heavily to be found all over uh, this present uh, crisis. And the British government is, has played almost no part except to try and make things uh, worse. They have taken the most belligerent uh, line from the beginning. Uh, both Liz Truss and Boris Johnson have said Putin must fail and be seen to fail. Well, you know, that's fine rhetoric, but what does it actually mean? What it means is that Britain will fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood, because that's that, that's where the, who's going to do the fighting, to try and defeat Putin, when clearly a, a negotiated settlement is essential, a negotiated settlement that uh, uh, recognises the security concerns of Russia and also upholds the integrity and sovereignty of uh, Ukraine. And that is what we need to get to. But the British government is contributing little or nothing to that. And I fear that if a negotiated settlement comes in view, and it looks possible that it might, uh, then the USA and Britain will be working to try and sabotage it and will work to try and uh, prolong uh, the war. That is the danger that we're, uh, uh, that we're facing. Our demands as an anti-war movement now are, first of all, no escalation. Uh, the fact that there's even talk of nuclear war uh, ought to be alarming uh, enough. Uh, No-fly zones, which are, are being advocated in some quarters, are a recipe for a third world war. It means basically NATO pilots confronting Russian pilots uh, above the skies of, uh, uh, of Ukraine. So we want no uh, further, no escalation. In fact, there needs to be nuclear de-escalation in Europe. And that actually was one of the original Russian demands when the negotiations started in, uh, uh, in December. There has to be a stop to NATO expansion, and there has to be a development of an integrated, all-embracing security regime uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe. So the danger is that this conflict will actually go in the other direction. However it ends, it will end up with NATO being strengthened, with vast increases in defence spending, we're already seeing that in Germany, uh, and uh, uh, negative consequences for living standards uh, across, uh, across Europe, as I think Mary uh, outlined. This is a war that is going to hit ordinary working people in their pockets um, and in terms of uh, food and fuel uh, uh, prices. 
The final thing I quickly want to touch on before finishing uh, is to say that one of the extraordinary aspects of this has been the attack on Stop the War uh, in a context generally of a extraordinary war psychosis in Britain, uh, hysteria, uh, 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 Russophobia, uh, worse than I can recall in any war in my lifetime, uh, the, the, uh, uh, and the silencing of any dissenting voices in the media, uh, and the absolute, you know, uh, solidarity of the whole establishment behind the most aggressive position. The attacks on Stop the War and the anti-war movement haven't come from the government. They haven't mainly come from the mainstream uh, media. They have come from the leader of the Labour Party, from the right wing of the Labour Party that has seen this. That, that Again, like the government, have had nothing to contribute to any settlement of this dispute, not a single idea as to how to bring peace to Europe, all they can think of is a factional fight against the left in the Labour movement. Now, I'm delighted that Stop the War's position has been echoed broadly by several major unions, including Unison, RMT, uh, uh, the FBU and the NEU. So th there's a broad base of understanding that this isn't just about solely uh, Russian aggression. It's also about NATO and its expansion. We need to stand firm to maintain the connection between the anti-war movement and the labour movement and to challenge this right-wing witch hunt that has been driven by Keir Starmer, who somehow imagines that by trying to be more belligerent than the Tories, he will win uh, a general uh, election. This situation is far too serious for that sort of factional uh, point scoring. So I hope that when I know that the Communist Party and hopefully everyone on this meeting this evening will be uniting uh, to strengthen the anti-war movement, strengthen its links with the Labour movement and advance a policy of peace and security for all peoples. Thank you. Unmute. Andrew, thank you very much for your contribution. Unfortunately, Andrew has to leave early this meeting. He's got another commitment. So he's asked uh, if you could um, put your questions in the chat and I, the questions and contributions in the chat, I will um, filter them to Andrew first so he can respond once the other speakers have completed their contributions. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I think it was very important, the comments you made about the Labour Party and the need for the Labour movement already, three unions, you highlighted three unions, who are opposing the war and have taken a strong position um, on, on this question. Our second speaker is Jenny Clegg. And Jenny, thank you very much for being with us. Jenny is an expert on China. She is a researcher specializing on China. She is an author of China's global strategy towards a multipolar world. She's also a very long-term activist for peace a member of CND National Council and of Greater London, Manchester Stop the War. Thank you for being with us, Jenny, and I'm sure your contribution is very important in this global conflict. Thanks very much, Mary, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation, um, giving me the opportunity. Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, understanding what is happening in the Asia Pacific and in uh, US-China relations is vital in setting this current crisis in context. It's no doubt that the international situation is in flux and at a historic turning point. And I view this in terms of the dynamic between a multipolarity which is pushed forward by the rise of developing countries um, around China and the unipolarity of US hegemonism. Um, and I will also mention, uh, as Mary uh, said in her introduction, uh, China's response to the, um, to the current crisis. So um, first of all, uh, in the last couple of years, the US relationship with China has become the most important one uh, for the world. Seeing China as the main challenger, the US began a new hegemonic offensive with the launching of the new Cold War. And I think that this is a factor uh, influencing uh, Putin's assessment of the, of the predicament that Russia was in. Um, we had a seminal speech in July 2020 by Pompeo, Communist China and the Free World's Future, in which he reversed the Nixon-Reagan policy of engagement. And he said, securing our freedoms from the CCP is the mission of our time. 
If we bend the knee now, our children's children may be at the mercy of the Chinese Communist Party. Setting the stage here for this new uh, hegemonic drive was first of all Trump's withdrawal from the International Nuclear Forces Treaty in August 2019, indicating that the US and NATO were committed to new nuclear missile capabilities in order to deal with Russia and China. And then there was NATO 2030, the 2030 vision, which came out in June 2020, which transformed NATO into a political military, in other words, a Cold War military alliance to meet the challenges from so-called great power competition. And it's very clear, looking at this, that they saw Russia first and then China second. Um, now, under Biden, foreign policy uh, shifted its focus on China from the South China Sea to Taiwan. And then importantly, whereas Trump didn't care about allies, Biden is pursuing a so-called multilateralism to forge the alliance of democracies. So why this shift? To multilateralism because so far the United States realized that it had failed to check China's rise uh, which was now on course to overtake the US in economic size by around 2030 and US strategists then realized they couldn't contain China or defeat China alone to maintain America's number one position in the world um, it has to strengthen its alliances by dividing the world into a new cold war so here we have the uh, ideological drive, the narrative, identifying Russia and China as a threat to the rest of the world so as to promote US leadership as the solution. And then with this, there's the Cold War agenda uh, of prioritizing military over economic interests in order to get countries to break with China, which has now become the main trading partner for some 180 countries around the world. The two target areas for building this alliance of democracies, this so-called alliance of democracies, are the East Asia and Europe, both in danger of becoming too accommodating to China, needing to be brought more firmly under US hegemonic control in order to prevent uh, the trend towards multipolarity. And it's important to note here that uh, East Asia um, um, is predicted to uh, comprise 40% of the world economy uh, by 2030, therefore overtaking Europe as the world's most important economic region. So in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Biden has sought to contain China's rise by strengthening the Quad, Australia, Japan, and drawing India as well closer to the United States. But to maintain US hegemony over the Pacific required more military muscle, hence AUKUS, as Mary mentioned at the beginning, with the Anglosphere of the US, UK and Australia providing the hardcore nucleus of an Asian NATO. This caused a certain disarray, weakening uh, unity within the region, uh, but the development also really shook up Macron, who saw the diesel submarine deal with Australia as underpinning a new Europe-Asia-Pacific partnership. And I think this explains a lot about Macron's diplomatic energy um, in the current crisis. So we can see developments in the Indo-Pacific against China paralleling those uh, in, the Euro, uh, in the Europe against uh, Russia. The US confrontational and prov provocative approach the divisive ideological narrative, the increasing militarization of Taiwan as well as Ukraine and of both regions as a whole, the broken promises to Russia over NATO expansion and the near breaking of US commitment on the one China policy. And let's not forget how bad US-China relations were at the time of Russia's invasion with the diplomatic US diplomatic boycott of the Olympics. And perhaps we can also see a sequence of events um, here with um, AUKUS declared in September and then by February China criticizing NATO for the first time ever supporting Russia's legitimate security concerns as if to say we know how you feel and we can only speculate that China uh, that Putin felt China had his back and was therefore emboldened to embark on his adventurous war. Now, uh, China's response, as Mary uh, mentioned, um, they notably abstained on US sponsors' votes at the UN and has fallen short of uh, calling Russia's action an invasion. And the US hawks like Blinken and Sullivan and their other supporters around the world 
uh, trying to ensnare and implicate China in this uh, in one way or another as backing Putin. Um, uh, as Liz Truss uh, declared a few days ago, will China stand by as a whole nation is destroyed? First of all, I think I want to say that uh, I don't think that by C uh, had any idea of this in advance. You know, there are 6,000 Chinese citizens in Ukraine, and if they'd had any inkling of this, they would have pulled them out pronto. Um, I think that we should also note that, you know, China has had very good relations with Ukraine, uh, which joined the Belt and Road Initiative. And also China hasn't recognized the annexation of uh, Crimea in 2014. So the UN Charter is, of course, fundamental and all progressives should support it. Um, China has reconfirmed its commitment to UN principles, but in the same breath points to the responsibility of major powers to jointly maintain stability in the world. It's called for the recognition of security concerns of all parties and uh, commitment to seek peaceful settlement. Peaceful coexistence is the foundation of, US, of China's foreign policy after all. At the heart of the matter here, it seems to me, there's a question of what it means to be a responsible world power. Western leaders say, it's about upholding Ukraine's sovereign rights. For China, major powers are responsible for world peace, and this will not be achieved through war and sanctions. Foreign Minister Wang Yi has set out China's responsibility in a six-point plan for humanitarian aid, which makes a point of saying this should not be used for political purposes. And this aid is now going to Ukraine. So with good relationships with both Russia and the Ukraine, China has emerged as a possible mediator, but this remains to be seen because of course there are factors involved that are beyond China's control. There's been some speculation about a kind of a JCPOA arrangement involving the five permanent members of the UN Security Council to guarantee a peaceful settlement. Um, this uh, obviously would include China, but past history shows that the reshaping of the security architecture for Europe around peaceful coexistence with Russia has failed to tackle the issue of European dependence on the US military. So we've seen the failure of Helsinki Accords, the Normandy format, the Minsk agreements, and so on and so forth. The sticking point, of course, is the US refusal to give up its hegemony and accept a multipolar world in which it has to negotiate with other powers. So just coming, making a few points uh, before I conclude, um, who's going to come out the winner? For sure, not the people of the Ukraine, nor the people of Europe, nor the people of the world. Putin has succeeded contrarily in restoring NATO's original purpose to keep the US in Europe, Russia out and Germany down. And the US is using sanctions now to drive the Cold War division deeper. Europe is committed to increasing defense spending, as is Japan, where the influential former Prime Minister Abe is suggesting the country needs US nuclear missiles. The world economy is being wrenched up in an effort to recenter it around what Michael Hudson has called the three key pillars of US capitalism, the military industrial complex, financial services, and the gas and oil industries. China may yet be prevented from overtaking the US. But there are also possible counter hegemonic trends. The Quad is divided on the issue. China was not alone in abstaining. India did too. So did South Africa, uh, another BRICS member. And whilst Brazil expressed reluctance about voting to deplore US in, uh, Russian invasion. Rising global prices of food and energy will hit the global south hard, and the world is still tackling the pandemic uh, and it has to face the climate catastrophe. The world has become more unequal and global governance is failing, uh, yet instead of fixing this, the developed world is embroiling, uh, embroiled in war and division. In the immediate moment, countries look to their military defence, but how long governments will be able to put military interests first in Cold War style may depend on economic pressures mounting from below. For China, in every crisis, there are opportunities. With economic growth set for 5.5 this year, which is very ambitious, um, but and nevertheless, it may come out of this crisis as an increasingly important pole of economic stability for its many trading partners. 
Then there are other questions which are still impossible to answer. For example, to what extent will the US be distracted from its Indo-Pacific strategy? And has NATO's refusal to commit directly to Ukraine's defense further undermined US credibility as a reliable ally following on from its chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan? Things look bleak, but maybe over time, this resurgence of US hegemonism may turn out to be not so straightforward. As Mao said, and I always like to finish with a quote from, quote from Mao, you can't catch 10 fleas with 10 fingers. Thanks. <laughs> Love the quote, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. That was um, really gave a much wider overview of the developing crisis we're facing, uh, not just in Europe, but uh, across the world, and for clarifying the position with AUKUS and all these belligerent um, and uh, war, war mongers. Questions are coming in, but I won't, uh, I'm noting them. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker is Kevin Nelson. Thank you for being with us, Kevin. Kevin is Secretary of the Communist Party's International Commission. He is member of the Communist Party's Executive Committee. He's an experienced trade unionist uh, in the Northwest. And he also represents the Communist Party on the Stop the War Steering Committee. Kevin, thank you very much. It's your turn. Thank you, Mary. Uh, comrades, uh, it seems to me that there's no question that we are now well and truly in a second Cold War with enormous geopolitical repercussions, uh, with the instigation by Russia of hot war in Ukraine, the EU's fast-track militarism, rearmament by Germany and Japan, Finland, Sweden, possibly Ireland abandoning neutrality, the use of financial and trade sanctions as economic warfare on an unprecedented scale and the relentless Western propaganda against China. A common factor in these crises and military tensions is NATO, and I will be talking mainly about NATO, its history and global strategies today. So what is NATO? The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a military alliance between 30 North American and European countries. NATO's origins are in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. It's, it's widely accepted that the use of the atomic bomb against Japan was a demonstration of US military power against the Soviet Union. A move from hot war to cold war was in the making and triggered by Churchill's Iron Curtain speech in 1946. NATO's 12 founding members in 1949 were Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Britain, and the US. In the 1950s, Greece, Turkey, and West Germany joined NATO. It was the rearmament of West Germany in 1955, which led to the formation of the Warsaw Pact by the socialist countries led by the Soviet Union. Spain joined in 1982 after a fiercely contested referendum. At the end of the first Cold War, the Warsaw Pact was dissolved in 1991, but NATO was not, even though its original purpose was to counter the Soviet Union and the spread of socialism. It's worth noting in the first 40 years of its existence, NATO did not wage any hot wars or overt military campaigns. But as Andrew said, in the past 30 years, it has launched repeated wars of aggression, bombing Yugoslavia, invading Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and supporting attacks on Syria. In her opening comments, Mary said that a causal factor in the current Ukraine crisis has been NATO's territorial expansion towards Russia. Between 1999 and 2020, a further 14 Central and Eastern European countries joined NATO. We've also had increasingly aggressive posture by NATO, uh, including out of area operations with its so-called global partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea in the Asia Pacific region. In 2017, NATO expanded into Latin America, signing a partnership with the brutal regime in Colombia, another global partner. This was upgraded to major uh, non-NATO ally status on the visit of the Colombian president to the White House last Thursday. 
And only a few days ago, China warned the US against trying to build a Pacific version of NATO and to stop its interference in Taiwan. The combined military spending of NATO is well over 70% of the world's total. It requires members to commit at least 2% of GDP to defense spending by 2024, something successfully enforced by Trump, contrary to his go-it-alone reputation. In fact, Trump's defense investment pledge was unanimously agreed in the final declaration of NATO's London summit in December 2019. NATO has a vast nuclear capability. US, Britain and France being states with nuclear weapons. And five NATO countries host US nuclear weapons. Germany, Turkey, Italy, Belgium and Netherlands, all guarded by US soldiers. In all of these countries, there are high levels of opposition to the US nuclear presence and strong peace movements. In 2020, the Belgian parliament voted narrowly to retain US nuclear weapons, the support of the far right in that decision being decisive. In early 2020, NATO was conducting its largest military exercise in Europe for 25 years, Defender Europe 20. It involved 37,000 troops from 18 countries before it was eventually called off because of the pandemic. Last year, in Steadfast Defender 2021, the US deployed, uh, deployed additional 9,000 troops to Europe, including in the Balkans and the Black Sea Basin. As we meet tonight, NATO is conducting a military exercise Cold Response 2022 with 30,000 troops from 27 nations, including the Rapid Reaction Force in Arctic Norway, just a few hundred kilometers from Russia's borders. It's also worth remembering that 70,000 US troops are permanently stationed in Europe although today they're boosted to over 100,000, bigger than the entire British army. Support for NATO is a major dividing line between left and right in the Labour movement. Labour politicians, Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevan were instrumental in the creation of NATO, and Labour has remained staunchly pro-NATO to the present day, as we've heard. Starmer's doubled down on Labour MPs from signing Stop the War statements on the Ukraine war and barring them from attending Stop the War rally a couple of weeks ago. His advisor, Philip Collins, writing in the New Statesman, praised Starmer for reclaiming Labour's history, although in reality, there's been very few discontinuities in Labour's support for NATO since 1949. During the general election campaign in 20, December 2019, when Defence Chief Sir Nick Carter warned Jeremy Corbyn on Sky News that NATO is very important for national security, he needn't have bothered. Labour's manifesto included maintaining our commitment to NATO, support and renewal of Trident nuclear deterrent, a commitment to spend 2% of GDP on defence, a staggering 42 billion. Of course, at that time, Labour's supine position got no credit from the US empire. It seems a long time ago, but we shouldn't forget the then US Secretary of State Pompeo's leaked comments that it could be that Mr. Corbyn manages to run the gauntlet and gets elected. It's possible. You should know that we won't wait for him to begin to do those things to push back. We will do our level best. It's too risky, too important and too hard once it's already happened. Yet all we hear about is Russian and latterly Chinese interference in British politics. NATO's spokespeople are stridently ideological and political. For example, its Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, for many years, Labour Party Prime Minister in Norway, before his NATO appointment in 2014, has a mantra that China and Russia don't share NATO's values of freedom and democracy, they promote alternative models of governance, and they deny sovereign democratic nations the right to choose their own future. This coming from a US-dominated transnational organisation, which opposes the legitimacy of national solutions. Only the NATO-approved way of life, heavily military capitalist economies under the hegemony of the US is legitimate. Even today, after the meeting of NATO defense ministers attended by the Ukraine, Sweden, Finland, Georgia, and the EU, Stoltenberg said that NATO would be developing new and expanded postures in all domains, land, air, sea, cyber, and space, and invariably, called on member states to make investments in increased military spending. And so on it goes. Since the demise of the USSR, 
the imperialist powers led by US and Britain have engaged in a massive escalation of arms programs, military interventions, they've expanded NATO eastwards towards Russia, and they've surrounded China with military bases. This has been done in tandem with the European Union and its pro-NATO common foreign and security policy. Given the current international situation, it's essential that the peace movement deals with NATO's reactionary role in the world. And the unity of the British peace movement on the NATO question is not mirrored in all of the NATO member states. Both uh, CND and Stop the War have produced excellent briefings which are available online. A strong peace movement in this country has never been more important. It matters because Britain is a global power in arms industry, diplomatic, economic, intelligence gathering, military power, nuclear weapons, and so on. It is a threat to world peace. Anyone who watched the Ukraine debate in Parliament could sense the appetite across all parties for conflict and escalation rather than a political solution to the crisis in Ukraine. Building support for Stop the War and CND in unions and local communities can make a difference. It was uh, remarkable that Labour CND was able to win a substantial majority at last year's Labour conference for an emergency motion opposing the AUKUS pact, and that pressure must be kept on the leadership of the Labour Party. Just finally, a few words on the current situation in Ukraine. It's been widely reported that, and stated in the UN by Britain's ambassador <clears throat> that Russia's decision to recognise the two independent republics and subsequent military intervention was unprovoked. It's simply not the case. A phenomenal number of arms and military hardware has been supplied to Ukraine by Western powers in recent years and in particular in recent months. It's all documented in the House of Commons Library report. It declares some of it at least, uh, particularly the enormous capacity building programme that Britain's undertaken for the Ukrainian army. In 2020, NATO gave Ukraine enhanced opportunity partner status. It's also a priority partner of the EU. The Minsk to Accord, which incidentally was never accepted as legitimate, by the Ukrainian elite or Western hawks has been ignored by the Ukrainian uh, government over the past eight years. And instead, a continuous war of aggression has been waged by Ukrainian forces, including neo-Nazi elements in the Azov Brigade against the people of Donbass. From February onwards, as diplomatic efforts faltered, the war was intensified with OSCE monitors reporting a massive tenfold escalation in ceasefire violations by Ukrainian forces. Rather than engaging with Russian concerns about security guarantees, the war propaganda from NATO in the last few weeks up the ante, Zelensky threatening to renounce Ukraine's non-nuclear status at the Munich Security Conference, the relentless lobbying against Nord Street 2, all have contributed to the Russian military escalation, which of course, as has been said, is counterproductive and risks a major escalation into all-out war. As Comrade Rob Griffiths said in his Marx oration on Sunday, NATO and the EU played a major part in creating the conditions which made the Ukraine war all but inevitable, but this cannot justify the brutal military aggression launched by Russia against the people of Ukraine. Russia has indeed unleashed a humanitarian catastrophe it has played into the hands of those opposing the Minsk II Accord, which is endorsed by the UN Security Council and is the only basis for a negotiated settlement of the conflict, guaranteeing Ukrainian security within its borders, as well as meeting Russian security concerns. Eventually, such terms will form the core of a political settlement leading to a ceasefire and Russian withdrawal, remote as that scenario might seem tonight. The Communist Party's priority is to campaign to stop the war and start the peace. For a peaceful resolution of the crisis, military de-escalation, including the withdrawal of Russian forces, and support for the peace movement's demand for a pan-European security framework. We do that first and foremost by demanding a change in policy from our own warmongering government and its impersonators on the Labour Party front bench. In the longer term, 
Our aim must be an independent foreign and defence policy for Britain, including the closure of British military bases overseas and foreign military bases in Britain, as well as unilateral nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Kevin, thank you very much. Great contribution. Lots to think about. Now we move to questions and contributions. I've got three currently. I've got two questions and one contribution. And if our speakers are in agreement with that, I'll just read what I've got. And sorry, I was just looking. Um, there's a, a further contribution that's just come in. Maybe I'll just start with the two questions. The first one is from Raymond Many, Raymond Many, and he says. Could you please explain the Communist Party of Russia's Federation Duma deputies who were at the forefront in encouraging Putin to recognize the Donetsk and Lugansk republics and how to re react to those Duma delegates being included in Western sanctions? That's the first question. The second question is from Clive Swan. How do you suggest addressing Russia's justifiable issues. NATO has been poking the bear for 20 years, holding war games on Russia's border and finding, funding neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Shall we start with that or shall I go on to the contributions, comrades? Maybe, maybe I'll read the couple of contributions so you've got an overview of what's being said. Is that all right? Andrew? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go quite soon, Mary, as I said but earlier. Do you want to answer those two questions and maybe I'll, then I'll read the contributions? Yeah. And uh, well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I mean, Kevin, as the International Secretary of the Party, might be better placed to answer the questions about the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. I mean, from what I know, they have the attitude towards the Putin regime perhaps has an aspect of ambivalence uh, and... Um, uh, so I don't um, know how much weight to put on the fact that they support the recognition of the Donetsk and Luhansk republics. But the problem is, it is a step away from the Minsk II Accords, which Kevin rightly emphasised as a basis for a solution. Uh, so that is something that has to be negotiated between Ukraine and Russia as part of a settlement. Um, the fact that the Duma delegates have been sanctioned, well, that's just performative theatrics by the British um, uh, government. I don't suppose most of them have any uh, assets or whatever in London uh, at all. Now, Clive Swan uh, asks uh, how to address Russia's justifiable issues. Well, in a way, there's, there's two levels of negotiation. One is negotiation between Ukraine and Russia, uh, and they have to resolve the problem of the Russian population or the Russian-speaking population in Donetsk, Luhansk, and for that matter, elsewhere in the Ukraine. That's a bilateral matter for them. I think the, the, the rights of self-determination, Ukraine has a right of self-determination, so too the Russian people within Ukraine. And they, that, that has to be uh, discussed and negotiated what form that might uh, take. The larger security issues, of course, involve the United States and Britain. Uh, they, uh, uh, the, the negotiations, the diplomatic negotiations before this war broke out were mainly being conducted between Moscow and Washington. Um, and uh, of course, Ukraine can decide to withdraw its application for NATO membership. But in a way, we don't want to, uh, it's right to focus on that, but not just on that, because the United States bilateral military relationship with Ukraine, and Kevin uh, um, mentioned this, there was an agreement, I think I mentioned that that was signed just last uh, autumn, can go on regardless of whether Ukraine is actually in NATO or not. So there needs to be a more comprehensive agreement. The architecture for that is potentially there with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. That's been there for decades as a body. Uh, that needs uh, empowering. Uh, and of course, what the detail of that would be, uh, we, we can't outline uh, outline here, but it has to guarantee security for everyone, for Russia, for Ukraine, for the rest of Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, and, and have you know realistic agreements that can prevent any wars or conflicts uh, uh, between them. That shouldn't be um, impossible. It should have been done 30 years ago at the end of the Cold War. Um, Stop the War Coalition has always been against NATO. 
We actually think it should have been wound up at the same time as the Warsaw Treaty Organization was wound up at the end of the Cold War. The immediate uh, thing must be to get it to cease its uh, uh, aggressive expansion uh, eastwards. So uh, I think uh, I think that probably answers the questions as uh, as uh, 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 as best I can. I and mean, as Clive puts it, we've got to stop poking the bear uh, and um, uh, 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 you know stop this uh, expansion uh, of NATO uh, up to the borders of Russia. Thank you, Andrew. Um, <laughs> And I, um, thank you for, for being with us tonight and best wishes for your evening tonight. Now, I don't know, uh, Jenny and Kevin, more questions are coming in. Do you want to answer these two first? And then I move on to the, uh, the next questions. Jenny, is there anything you want to say? Because it's more about Russia, or but you might have comment, a comment to make. Uh, sorry, I was muted. No, I, I'll pass on those questions. Okay. All right, Jenny. Thanks. Kevin? Uh, yes. On, on the issue of the Communist Party, the Russian Federation, uh, I can deal with that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, it was the party's deputies who pushed uh, in the Duma. Uh, they moved the uh, resolution for recognition of the republics, which had been on the table for eight years because de the republics declared independence back in 2014. Um, the Duma then approved uh, the party motion. Um, it was a precursor to a, a mutual support agreement, and that was then the basis for the for the uh, launch of the military operation and invasion. That was the sequence. Um, I, I think the vast majority of communist parties in the world um, oppose um, the invasion and the recognition of the republics. I think it arose from um, a sense that um, uh, the people of Donbass needed to be defended. There's over 800,000 Russian uh, citizens in Donbass. Um, you know, the, so therefore it was felt, you know, there being 13,000 deaths, something needed to be done about it. The, um, the, the, there was no peacekeeping force there. There were these uh, offensives from the Ukrainians that were building up and so on. That was the scenario. Um, there's also a big reference to denazification in, 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 in the position that the parties put forward from, from Russia. Um, as Andrew said, it's overstated. The, the, the Nazi elements are there. The Azov Battalion itself has less than 2,000 uh, members um, in, in the Ukrainian forces. Um, as an organization, as a political uh, section it, it, it got, got less than three percent of the vote in the uh, 2019 elections in Ukraine. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think it's um, it's a credible uh, position necessarily. Um, and and latterly, um, there's growing dissent in the party from the position. Um, the several Duma deputies have come out uh, against the invasion. And, and call for um, a, a, a cessation of hostilities uh, and a ceasefire. So that's the position of the Russian party, the best of my knowledge. The statements of the Russian party are available for their comrades to read on the SolidNet website. They're all set out in detail there. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Kevin, there's a comment from Barry Ryan who says, Kevin Island has never been neutral allowing the US military to use Shannon Airport as a transit hub for its forces. This crisis has reignited the debate in Ireland, and I hope it will lead finally to a bolstering of our neutrality. I would urge comrades to watch Claire Daly's and Mike Wallace's contributions to the Euro Parliament on this issue. They have been vilified in the mainstream Irish press, but it has garnered public support widespread public support. Uh, a number of questions are coming up, both in the, the Q&A and in the chat. So I'll go to the Q&A now. There's a point by Diane Randall here. Andrew touched on a security regime for Europe. Could he elaborate? Unfortunately, Andrew has left on what he envisages this, this to be. Maybe uh, either Jenny or Kevin might want to talk about that. 
What is his view about campaigning to not only highlight the expansion of NATO, but to highlight its dissolution as necessary too? We are seeing in this period a shift in the power dominance in the world and the US empire is losing its economic power. It is sustained by its mighty military power, but this is fundamentally an unstable position and makes the US more dangerous for the world than ever. Um, there's a lot more questions, so I'll just go to the next one from Deepa. How will the unprecedented variable of social communications via technology and AI impact global socio-cultural relations among civilians in regards to the resurgence of the Cold War? And what can we do to maintain peace and stimulate the anti-war movement in a socio-cultural technological context? Then a question from Mike Atkinson, whether the dictatorship of the proletariat is, has been necessary since at least 1830, was temporarily achieved by the Paris Commune, failed in 1918, and has been in question ever since. Mao's China, however we describe it, is not the dictatorship of the proletariat. That's for you, Jenny. <laughs> to my mind, only organizing the international working class with a view to their dictatorship, the smashing of the bourgeois state can avoid crises and wars like this. Um, imperialism, after all, is not merely a moral question. Communists should not therefore be afraid of calling for the international dictatorship of the proletariat. Next question from Peter Middleman to the panel. <laughs> How big a setback to the unity on the left that will be required to meet the cost of living crisis has been caused by sections of the ultra left and liberal center cheerleading for war and misreading the role of NATO. Um, I'm going to just, I've got the Peter Middleman. Uh, one more here from Ruilin Zhang. Um, during maintaining a capitalist society, any so-called justified intervention war hides its original dark intention as long as competition exists between different geographical economic entities or capitalist countries and socialist countries like China, there will be no democracy. Um, sorry, I've lost it here. There will be no democracy and justice. Think about McCarthyism and political purge in the Soviet Union. Then somebody asked, can we have a question at a time? Well, I've loaded you with questions. There are more coming in, but if you don't mind answering some of these questions, uh, it's a bit difficult taking them one at a time because there are too many. So um, shall I call on Kevin first? Kevin, do you want to answer some of these questions or points? I'll just pick up a couple, a couple of them. Um, on the issue of te uh, social media and technology, I think it's clear um, the ownership and control, um, the concentration of ownership and control in a few global corporations has got serious implications for censorship. You know, we've seen um, a lot of media removed um, from online. It's given a very one-sided uh, narrative on the war, and I think it's enabled the um, the the, the anti-Russian um, position to dominate um, all coverage of, of the war. Um, it, it's a problem. We need we need a far more diverse um, media online. Um, it's very difficult to access the alternative point of view at the moment. But then we shouldn't play all this out online necessarily. You know, we need to mobilize and we need to mobilize uh, locally uh, in terms of demonstrations and rallies against the war. And we need to mobilize across borders. And in June in Madrid, uh, there's a NATO summit and there's a counter summit that the European peace movement are mobilizing for. So we shouldn't allow ourselves to be constrained by the, uh, the problems of uh, control on social media. On Peter's question about the pro-war, uh, the pro-NATO elements in the left, I mean, I don't think they're particularly significant. Um, 
I, I don't think they're particularly left either, really, to be honest. Um, they're pro-imperialist. They're the useful idiots of imperialism uh, in the labor movement. They're always around when wars take place. We had the same <clears throat> phenomena in the Iraq war, uh, the Houston group, I think it was called. And, <clears throat> you know, we shouldn't be distracted by them. Uh, I, I don't think they're a force in the, in the labor movement, particularly there are a few commentators. Um, I think generally um, the, the anti-war movement uh, in the in, in the broader labor movement is united, as I said. Um, it's not necessarily the case in France and Spain, where there's differences around NATO. I think in Britain the the um, the, the peace movement's influential and united, and it, you know it deserves our support. And it's important that in our unions um, we we push the case um, for peace and against the war, against escalation against arms sales and supplies, um, which, which get compounding the problem. And I, it's good to see that various unions are starting to do that. Thank you, Kevin. Jenny, do you want to comment? I'll do my best. Uh, thanks, Mary. So there's an awful lot of... Uh, to take in. An awful lot of uh, issues uh, um, and complicated ideas uh, that have been put forward. Um, but I, I will make a few remarks um, in terms of, um, you know, having a peaceful settlement in Europe. You know, I, I, I suppose I'm looking at this from a different uh, angle. Uh, I'm not sure that Europe can be disentangled from um, Asia in this. And we really have to understand the US uh, motivation here, um, which is uh, the race with China and, uh, you know, trying to secure its um, realm of, um, of uh, influence uh, and, and rally that, um, uh, you know, against, uh, against China and the control of Europe is, is absolutely vital here. I don't think the US is going to give anything up lightly. Um, and um, I think that uh, the, this, uh, you know, the question about um, the um, digital world, I think is absolutely central here because really Russia, uh, sorry, the US and China are racing to the technological frontier here um, in terms of the um, setting digital standards. Um, and China now is talking about setting, uh, becoming a standard setter uh, in the next 15 years. Um, and um, it was very interesting to see in the AUKUS agreement, this wasn't just simply about the nuclear powered submarines, but actually talking about cooperation uh, in um, quantum, uh, quantum computing, AI, and so on. Uh, so there is this, uh, this uh, technological race uh, to, the, to the new frontiers that is uh, you know, uh, underlying this kind of competition. Um, people are starting to talk not just about the military industrial complex, but that this involves, you know, not just the military, but also the media, uh, technology and science um, and intelligence. And that these are all kind of fusing together. Um, and it's very interesting to see uh, the, you know, the we have to appreciate the importance of the five eyes intelligent network, which involves uh, Britain with the US, Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, I think those five eyes. And they're now dictating, you know, how the world should be seen. So, you know, they get intelligence information. They say China is uh, supplying Russia with arms uh, and they're dictating the narrative. You know, they've got the intelligence, they're dictating the narrative. China is now challenging this and saying, well, give, where's your evidence? Show us the evidence. You know, why won't you... Uh, let, uh, you know, let the world inspect the biological uh, weapons, pot the potential biological weapons establishment uh, in, the, in the Ukraine. Um, and then I think this comes to the other point that I want to raise about the dictatorship of the proletariat. I mean, we, you know, we have to have a long term point of view. We have to look at the long term and the long term view is obviously that of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, but we have to also uh, understand uh, the, the theme of our times, 
um, if you like. And, uh, you know, where we are at the moment uh, is really trying to um, build uh, the position of peace and um, of uh, development and of um, a, a green transition. And those are the kinds of things that we really need to be forefronting. And I think that socialists uh, should do this, all progressives should, should, should do this. And so I think that, um, you know, the battle, winning, the, winning people over to the idea of common security, this is being taken up in the international peace uh, movement that, you know, that, that countries, sovereignty isn't just about countries being able to do whatever they want. You know, as Andrew said, they've got to take into consideration, you know, they've got to be good neighbours. And, you know, part of being good neighbours and being responsible powers in today's world is cooperating in order to tackle climate change and in order to tackle uh, the pandemic. And so I think that these are the kinds of um, uh, issues that, that we should be uh, mobilizing around and, and developing understanding of. Um, and I look to um, uh, developments, uh, for example, in South-South cooperation, um, if the global e economy is getting seriously damaged, um, that the uh, developing countries will look more to each other for support. And also, you know, the potential, although the Europe and the United States uh, are very much uh, united um, and Europe is being drawn into the US defence uh, uh, sphere, if you like, um, that nevertheless, there may be some difficulties uh, for, for, for Europe and uh, Europe might might be looking more towards China, for example, in terms of a green transition. So the Chinese will certainly be looking to uh, exploit the slightest rift, as Lenin said, uh, between the uh, imperialist powers. Um, and then there's also, you know, the, the, the Cold War narrative, which pits democracy against autocracy. And I think that this is something that we also have to rise to the challenge um, and perhaps be um, raising the question of what is democracy? You know, what actually is democracy? And the thing that I have in my mind is how the former Labour Prime Minister in Australia, his response to AUKUS was, you know, this, this is damaging our democracy. This is damaging our uh, sovereignty. You know, we're tying our foreign policy in with the United States simply in order to confront China, subordinating, subordinating all of our interests, if you like, you know, to this confrontation uh, with China. And, you know, we, 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 can, we can ask, you know, how democratic um, are countries if their, if their foreign policies are being dictated by uh, the United States? And so just to finish with um, the um, contribution from Ireland, I mean, yeah, let's all be neutral. Brilliant, Jenny, thank you for that and for, for answering all the questions so well. And I think that's right. We have to now build the peace movement and rebuild it again, support Stop the War, support CMD, and go out there and win the case. And we, we've got a huge argument that we can win particularly with the rising cost of living, which will affect working people in disastrous ways. Um, there are other comments coming up in the chat and in the Q&A, but I'm also very aware of time. And I think this is, um, uh, this is an opportunity for our panelists, our speakers to, to summarize uh, this meeting and to look ahead and call on us on what we can best do to build this peace movement, because that is what we have to do here. We've got this horrendous government, which is, um, <laughs> Boris Johnson has got away with murder, we can say. I mean, we were all hoping that maybe he would have to resign and then the war came along and he was able to save his skin. So we've got, the Tories are still here. We've got this Labour leader who is, uh, great supporter of NATO and supports the war and suspends Labour Party members who have been signing, uh, declaring the support for Stop the War. So 
we are in a very, very, very difficult situation in this country. And I think we need to get out there and we've got to get the argument on the doorstep in the community, our communities and in the labor movement. We've got to get more unions taking the same position as the NEU and the FBU and ensure that they also put pressure on the Labour Party to change their position. So I will call on Jenny again, is there anything you want to say to summarise uh, this meeting? Um, well, um, you know, I'll just, I just, uh, you know, repeat what, what I've said really, which is that we need to have a world view uh, we need to understand, uh, you know, what is motivating the United States. We need to understand this is a new um, uh, hegemonic uh, offensive um, and it won't be easy uh, for the US to, to change course. We have to be very realistic about the balance of forces and where we think, you know, a counter hegemonic uh, response may come from. I think that, uh, you know, the push from below in terms of building resistance against the, you know, pressures to put the burdens of this, uh, you know, restructuring onto the poorest people. That is something, you know, for us to do in Britain, uh, but we also have to, uh, you, know, you know, build on people's, um, you know, growing awareness of the uh, problems in the rest of the world, which were built really around the uh, COP26, you know, that, we, that you know, we, we can't just pass things all off onto the global south uh, and the world's poor. Um, and so I think that internationalism uh, here is, is very important. And I think that we just have to be very focused uh, with our arguments. I think that people are confused uh, in a way that I've never seen uh, such confusion. Uh, there's a huge uh, reaction of compassion and humanitarianism, and people are distressed by the constant uh, images are on the media and they feel helpless, they don't know what to do. Um, and um, we have to be very patient and try and explain, um, you know, what, what is going on and uh, where, where people's in interests are. And as I, I said, I think that, you know, the, 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 there are messages around uh, common security, there are messages around uh, equality and uh, global e equality, uh, you know, there are messages around uh, the com complete uh, corruption um, of the financial system, um, and, uh, you know, there are messages uh, about, you know, what is it that makes us secure, because we're getting people are feeling more and more and more insecure, so I'll leave it at that. Jenny, thank you very much. And um, it's certainly true that this world order will not give us peace. And we've got to make the case for a different world order. But I'm sure that is Kevin. Kevin will comment on this. Can I just say, Kevin, before you come in, um, there was a question in the chat about whether this uh, webinar is going to, can be followed on YouTube. It will certainly go on the Communist Party's Facebook page. So if you go to the Communist Party, Party's website, you will find it there. Kevin, would you like to make some final comments? Yes, uh, it is difficult, you know, in, in, in context of uh, war, <clears throat> humanitarian suffering, wall-to-wall uh, -wall media coverage, um, and so on, the sort of war psychosis that Andrew outlined in his talk. It is difficult to take a stand uh, for peace and particularly to contextualize uh, what's happening, but that's what we have to do. And um, there's uh, Stop the War has got activities organized in many towns and cities of the country. And we need to be there supporting those activities and where they're not planned, we need to organize them uh, to, to get the case for peace uh, out to the public, uh, to educate people. Um, so they're not um, dragged along with the, um, the pro, the, the pro-war, militaristic, no-fly zone uh, uh, agenda. Um, there's a, an important uh, Stop the War event in London on the 26th of March, which is uh, a teaching. Um, I encourage comrades who can to attend that, some great speakers. Uh, it's advertised on the uh, Stop the War uh, website. And I would encourage our, our party branches to 
organise more events like this, um, both uh, online uh, and in person, um, to take our, our case and our arguments out to the public. Um, so thanks to the branch for organising uh, tonight's event, and uh, I look forward to many more taking place in the coming weeks. And you'll certainly be invited, Kevin. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, uh, comrades. Uh, can I also take this opportunity to plug the Morning Star, which has given a very good analysis of the developments uh, regarding this war and uh, the more the wider issues that are con we are confronting. Please join Stop the War if you can. And the Communist Party is here. You're welcome to join the Communist Party and support the Communist Party and its activities in fighting for peace and a better world order. And thank you for all your contributions in the chat and in the Q&A. Maybe we haven't answered all your questions, but there were a lot of them. But there was a very lively debate going on in the chat, which shows that even though it's a webinar, it's still lively and worthwhile discussion does take place. So thank you to Andrew who's left us. Thank you to Jenny and thank you to Clevan. And I'm sure we will organize more meetings like these. I hope that this war comes to an end, but if it does, I think we will have to. So good night, everybody. And thank you again. Thank you.